now on to our, our last speaker of the first half. Um, and you may have spotted him earlier talking about Maker Night, but uh, this time he's going to talk about diamonds. Um, so maybe he's going to give us all diamonds or something, I don't know. He looked just very kind of enigmatic at me when I asked him what he was talking about. So uh, this is uh, Paul Freeman, who's going to be talking to us about diamonds. Okay, so why would I talk about diamonds? Well, diamonds to me are really interesting because they sort of make up something which isn't actually worth anything. They're not that rare, but their branding behind it has sort of propelled them into a world where people actually think they're amazing. Now, in 1948, De, Bear, De Bears launched what the Advertising Age magazine described as the most successful marketing campaign of the 20th century. They introduced the phrase, a diamond is forever. That's a phrase which now has sort of embedded itself in culture to the fact that people don't realise it's just an advert. It's becoming, you know, films have taken over that, and the tradition of giving engagement rings has always been around, but giving diamond engagement rings is something that De Bears sort of really promoted heavily from, from the 40s, to the point that in the 1960s, De Bears went a step further, and they actually invented the eternity ring. Um, and they used slogans such as, she married you for rich or poorer, let her know how it's going. Now, they, one of the underlying reasons, not just because they could sell more diamonds, they had a surplus of diamonds coming out of the Soviet Union at the time, which were much smaller than the ones you get out of Africa. So they needed a way of using all these tiny diamonds, um, basically to keep their market going. Now, it's difficult to say whether there is a monopoly held by the bears on the diamond market, they directly control it historically about 40 to 50% of the diamonds in circulation. Now, that gives them a turnover of about 6.8 billion a year. Now, the problem is they don't really sort of control just the diamonds. They control the mines. They control the circulation. And to the point that they often buy the um, diamonds from other people to sort of control the flow. That becomes a problem when you're buying them from people in, say, Sierra Leone, where you're then buying the diamonds off regimes which probably shouldn't be funded. That came to, the, to a head in the, the early of the century where the Kimberley process was put in place, which basically meant that all diamonds, rough diamonds, had to be certified to stop the flow of blood diamonds. And I, yeah. Now, Switch on to gold very slightly. Gold's very different from diamonds in that gold has historically always had real value. It's a currency up until the start of the 20th century. There was a direct link between your currency and the gold in your reserves. Now, that was great until two world wars later, Britain spent all its gold with America. And then in 1971, Richard Nixon decided to break the link between the, uh, gold and its currency so it could fund the Vietnam War. Now, as you know, you can't actually make gold very easily. Um, you, do, you can if you've got a particle accelerator and some nuclear fuel, but really you can't make gold so it's a good, stable currency. With diamonds, you can make them. In 1996, a 70-year-old guy named Carter Clark met a guy in Russia called Yuri Sermon. Um, he was in, in charge of Russia's high-tech bureau, which is basically selling all their technology to make not fake diamonds, but real diamonds. When you're producing a diamonds in a lab, they're real. They're ex chemically identical, and in many ways, they're sort of better than diamonds because they're flawless. So how do you create a diamond? Well, with Gemesis, they have a process where you use metal solvent, graphite. They increase the pressure to 58,000 atmospheres, charge it to 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. That dematerializes the carbon. They let it settle on the cooler end of the chamber, and three days later, you've got a three-carat diamond. Now, Apollo diamonds use a slightly different method. They use chemical vapor. They reduce the pressure, charge it with microwave to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, and that creates a plasma cloud which then rains onto a pre-primed sliver, and that grows down to about a quarter of a millimeter a day. So the end result is you're ending up with diamonds which the only way they can distinguish them between natural diamonds is they're better. The diamond industry actually is telling tell you that diamonds, because they're in a lab, are flawless, so they're faced with something which is a perfect product, but they're trying to sort of tell you 
it's not as much, worth as much as their naturally mined ones. So whether you think that's something which is identical, but a fraction of the price of a real product is really something you have to make up your own mind about. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, is that you doing research for your next Maker Night project or something? Are you going to be trying to work out how to make diamonds up in the uh, Art and Design Academy every month? Um, excellent. <laughs>